Good morning, everyone. I'm Dr. David Wild, Vice President of Performance Improvement, here again for Dr. Steve Stites, our Chief Medical Officer. He's out and about enjoying himself mm -hmm. this week, although I did get emails from him last night. So if he happens to be watching this morning, put your phone or computer down, Dr. Stites, and enjoy your time <laughs> away. Uh, we're coming to you live this morning from the Dolph Simons Jr. Family Broadcast Studio. Today we have Dr. Marissa Love back with us to talk about spring allergies versus COVID-19 symptoms. Mm -hmm. The pollen season has gotten longer. You might be feeling symptoms earlier, and if so, that's not your imagination. We'll help you navigate this in just a moment, but first, Dr. Hawk is back, mm -hmm. our Medical direct Director of Infection Prevention and Control, here with our numbers. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I saw things in haze. They look good. Mm -hmm. What happened here overnight? Yeah, well, Hayes has only two recovering, so no active infections. Uh, overnight, you know, we're still not doing bad. We're still in that total 20 to 30 range, although we kind of crept up a little bit to uh, double-digit active infections. We have 10 active infections, only two in the ICU, which is good, one on the ventilator, uh, but then 13 in that recovery period as well. So 23 total patients, which isn't bad. Again, I think we have been seeing, and that's what we will continue to see, hopefully, if we can continue to um, have lower cases in the Kansas City metro area, but kind of that area of 20 to 30 total infections, whether that's acute uh, plus the recovering patients as well. And I think that would be an okay uh, number or, or range to stay at, but certainly we would like it to be even lower. Yeah. And the sort of national news look mm -hmm. yesterday Not is good. for the first time really in several weeks we've seen a pretty sharp uptick yeah. in the national seven-day rolling average number of new cases and a continued increase in the number of states uh, that are seeing an increase in their seven-day average as compared to the previous week so uh, Kansas not yet in that yeah. boat we'll see today um, we'll have numbers again from Kansas and hopefully mm -hmm. we don't find anything there that we don't want to see uh, but we continue to pay attention to that, both uh, for the impact on our community, but also for the impact yeah. on our hospital, as Dana mentioned. 23 isn't, isn't um, something that, that gives us too much pain at the moment, but we know how quickly that can change. Yeah. Well, before we jump into our discussion this morning, are there any reporter questions on the line? Sure. Cody Holyoke from Channel 9. Good morning. Good morning, Cody. Hi, I have two questions for you. Uh, earlier this week, the head of the CDC, even the president, uh, voiced major concerns about states letting restrictions up too soon. Uh, Arkansas is now lifting their rules there. There's talk in Kansas about the governor encouraging counties to keep mask mandates in place. I'm curious your thoughts on this. Are you seeing a difference in patients who might be from places that are often opting out, or what are your concerns moving forward for that? Well, you know, a lot of good questions and, and some reasonable concern in there, too, I think. You know, we talked a little bit yesterday about um, uh, was there a risk of, of sort of stirring fear um, and, and sort of leading people to think there was no chance to, to avoid another round of a surge um, based on some of the comments, both from Dr. Walensky and, and from the, the Biden administration. I think you know, today my answer is very similar. Um, I think those concerns are very, very real. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're asking, Cody, are we seeing people coming from our community or for other communities who were infected in, by traveling to areas that, that have maybe relaxed restrictions? Uh, I don't think we've seen that pattern yeah, definitely not in the data. And Dana, mm -hmm. I don't know if you've seen it on the floors at all. Mm -hmm. No, I, you know, I don't think we, we would know that yet. Um, it is still quite early, uh, but certainly haven't, didn't see that, um, you know, when I was on service and on the floors. You know, this continues to be just a, really a majority of a behavioral uh, disease. So doing these things like lifting mass recommendations, we all want to get back to normal, um, you know, meeting with people, having fun, getting together, uh, you know, we're, we're kind of close to that. And, you know, I think things are different, much different now than they will be in a month and then uh, even much more different than they will be in June. But we are close to that, um, but we still can't let up our guard. And that's the issue is the administration and the CDC and Dr. Walensky are all being really cautious because we know how close we are. Being able to enjoy those things like going to the K with baseball starting up and getting out and taking those summer vacations and people being much more safe this year than they were than they were last year and being able to enjoy those types of things 
And, you know, the, the balance of that, of course, is all vaccines mm -hmm. and vaccination. Uh, Dr. Norman shared with us yesterday 43 out of every 100 yeah. adults um, has had a vaccine in Kansas. It mm -hmm. looks like in the total population, at least by CDC numbers, that's maybe 26% of the mm -hmm. overall Kansas population, including children. Um, just as a reminder, uh, that's almost exactly the same number of those who have received one dose as Michigan. Mm. So okay. these things, Cody, that you're asking about, um, the, the mitigation strategies that we know um, have been so important in preventing infections up until this point remain uh, just as important now as they did before. And um, we're hopeful that regardless of what the policy decision is around mask mandates or other mitigation measures, that um, as uh, the community sort of thinks about what they can do, um, that they uh, continue to remember that we have some control in this, even if there's not a public policy or a mask mandate requiring us to do those things that are important. Nice. Uh, my second question has to do with the Pfizer news today, company report mm -hmm. talking about the vaccine being 100% effective in kids 12 to 15. Uh, obviously, that's, that's yet to be reviewed, but I still want to get your take on that. Yeah, I'll start. Um, so uh, news this morning, without really seeing a full data set, roughly 2,200 or 2,300, I think, uh, kids in the United States between 12 and, and 16 um, who tolerated the vaccine well. And um, in that study group, those who received the vaccine, there were no documented active infections. In the control group of the same number, roughly the same number of unvaccinated in the same age group, there were 18 infections. And so that's the sort of way that the um, efficacy number of 100% was identified in this study. Uh, I think that's great news. Um, the one maybe caution I would add there is that um, I don't actually expect in real life to see 100% efficacy, and I'm not sure anyone should. Mm -hmm. And by that I mean um, this vaccine will be very effective mm -hmm. in the pediatric or in this young adult population, uh, the same as it is in the adult population. But it's probably not realistic for us to think or expect that there will be no infections, that it will be 100% effective. So that's not a knock at all. Please don't take it as that. It's just simply, um, I don't want anyone to run away and say, well, my child ended up testing positive after the vaccine, and so the vaccine doesn't work, because it's, it's just probably not realistic to expect that there will be 100% efficacy in a larger population. Yeah. And I think if there's any way to prevent that multi-system inflammatory process, mm -hmm. Even though it's small numbers, if it happens to your child, it's not good. And if, if there's any way to prevent that in our children, I think that would be a good thing. Today, before I was letting my daughter out of the car for school, she asked me, Daddy, when am I going to get the vaccine? Because we know uh, in our household that um, the kids you know, dislike every time flu season comes along. But they understand that's what has to happen uh, because I do get them their vaccines. And I just let them know that uh, I let my daughter know that probably not any time soon. We have to, number one, wait for the data wait for the analysis, wait for the, any emergency use authorization, and then, of course, the supply is important as well. So I think we are all excited to see if we can um, uh, you know, continue to, to show efficacy and safety in this group, and I do anticipate it will continue to be shown to be safe. Um, but, I mean, it is good news, and the more people we can have vaccinated, uh, the better, because we know that children can spread the disease as well. All right. Uh, this is Brian Grimmett with the Kansas News Service. I was just wondering, how concerned should we be about um, other variants like the UK variant that we started to see in a, in a few Kansas counties? Yeah. So, you know, if we again take a step back and look at the national picture, we know that areas that are seeing more rapid increases in new cases have a growing percentage, and in some cases, a majority of the of the isolates being tested. Uh, showing, for example, the B.1.1.7 mm -hmm. uh, variant, the UK variant. Um, there's also some growing concern, I wouldn't say evidence yet that I certainly believe, um, but some growing concern that there might be also an increased severity um, related to that strain, at least in some populations in the United States. We hadn't really yeah. seen that in other data sets, and so. I'm a little unsure of what exactly we're seeing here, but nonetheless, um, that question is being asked a bit more lately. As far as what that means for us here, um, we know that um, our borders, for example, from a state perspective or as a county, are really artificial when it comes to 
uh, how we travel and how disease spreads. And so we should be worried about the impact of uh, any of the variants of concern, mm -hmm. but most likely the most immediate and pressing, the, the UK variant. As we see in populations across the United States and really across the world, uh, what we're seeing in France, for example, now, and really a lot of the, the, um, the European Union, what we're seeing in South America, um, and, and even here, where cases are increasing and increasing rapidly, very much mirroring um, a previous surge in the, in the speed with which they're increasing. Um, that's likely related in no small part to those variants. So definitely a level of concern there. And Dana, yeah. clinically, um, I don't know that we've seen much of an impact, but we don't know yeah. really exactly what the impact is either in those that have been in our hospital. Yeah, and, and you know, we've heard from, um, we had an ICU director's call today and heard from uh, Secretary Norman and his component, uh, counterpart on the Missouri side, uh, Randall Williams, talking about, you know, looking at um, when they are testing um, water treatment plants. And they have seen a lot of the variants out there, even though we aren't seeing a lot of disease from that. I think there needs to be concern about those variants because there is uh, data from uh, the UK showing that there is higher level of mortality or severity of disease. Not everybody is convinced of that. Again, it's still being investigated, but if there is that concern, that is certainly um, an issue. We know that you can get reinfected with this variant or any other variant if you've already had COVID. Uh, that is why, you know, number one behavior we've already talked about, but vaccination is going to be the way out of this. We have seen um, through, through uh, published articles that um, the vaccines do offer protection against those variants. Um, whether it's uh, continued uh, antibody levels, uh, which they look at as a proxy for your immune response, or the T-cell response as well, which is very important in helping you fight off this, uh, this viral infection. So it is going to be important that vaccines do continue to roll out and reaching into those populations that are vaccine hesitant, whether it's some healthcare workers, whether it's urban populations, rural populations. We heard from our uh, guest one or two days ago how he's had COVID-19. He's not going to get the vaccine anytime soon. Um, we know that some other populations, you know, in the state of Kansas uh, are really refusing the vaccine and really continue to be vaccine hesitant. But that's all the more reason to get the vaccine because we know right now these vaccines can help give protection against even those variants of concern such as uh, the UK variant. This is Dan Cohen at Channel 41. Uh, we're hearing about people delaying their vaccine potentially if they're sick with a stomach bug, cold, mm -hmm. flu, et cetera, you know, illnesses that aren't necessarily COVID. Is there any truth to that? And if so, how long should they wait to get the vaccine after they uh, heal up from those ailments? Yeah, I mean, I think there's truth to the fact that people are delaying their vaccine because of those things. Um, I've even had people ask me because they are on antibiotics for things like a sinus infection or, or a skin infection. You know, there is no need to delay the, vaccine, the vaccination because of things like uh, a stomach bug or uh, if you're on antibiotics, you know, really as long as you're gonna be fever free for 24 hours or more, you can go ahead and get that vaccine. Once we are able to in the hospital, we are going to be giving it to even our ill patients in the hospital. Again, as long as you're fever free for 24 hours, there's really no contraindication. You can still go ahead and get that vaccine. Um, get it as soon as possible if you're offered that. Any other reporter questions on the line? I did have a question from Fox. We have actually two of them. Hmm. Heidi asks, Roger Goodell said during an interview on Tuesday that he expects to be able to have full occupancy at NFL stadiums for the 2021 football season. We'd like to hear your opinion, doctors, on whether that's a good idea. Hmm. Well, I would love us to be in a circumstance where that's yeah, possible. That's I think the that's first the first part. answer. Yes. Um, and then my second uh -huh. response is it's way too soon, yeah. I think, for us to comment on what would be a good or a bad plan uh, come the fall. Um, yeah. It's just, I think, too many unknowns. Uh, you know, we, we talked a bit yesterday. And we've used the term a lot over the past couple of months, right, this race between vaccination and variants. Um, and every time we have transmission and there's replication of the virus in a new host, a new patient, that that introduces more risk for new variants and that the cycle sort of continues. And so 
until we can break that, it's really hard to know if mm -hmm. we'll be in a place where we can do those sorts of things um, at any point, really, you know, with a, as far as a timeline. I think in the big picture we'll get there, but as far as whether it'll be by yeah. the 20... 21 football season you know i just don't know yeah i mean i think that's the important i agree with you wholeheartedly we would all love to have 68 69 70 thousand people at arrowhead again and then of course bring as many people down to the super bowl again to watch patrick mahomes and crew <laughs> win uh, but i think it is too early to tell we all would like to get there it's just i think there's just so many variables right now it's too early to tell Let's be really clear, the prediction that we can make with certainty, Dana's 100% spot on that the Chiefs will be in the Super Bowl and we'll watch <laughs> Patrick Mahomes lead us to a win. All right. like, I like that forecast, <laughs> yeah. And Heidi's second question is, a new report by a group called Parents Together mm. found that 58% of parents or caregivers would vaccinate their children against COVID-19 when it's available. When it comes to herd immunity, how much of an issue could it be if the majority of children eventually do not receive a COVID vaccine? Hmm. Yeah, so, um, you know, there are buried in there are a lot of questions. First, mm -hmm. what is the percentage of the population, any particular population that is necessary to get population immunity or, or the term more frequently used, herd immunity, meaning that transmission in that particular population um, slows to a rate where there's not continued growth um, of disease in that population. And so if we're talking about children uh, only and not the overall population, 60% probably is at the low end and mm -hmm. maybe even not enough mm -hmm. of um, uh, the population to prevent ongoing endemic sort of spread. But in the bigger picture, if 70% of adults or 75% of adults are accepting the vaccine and 60% of children, maybe for our overall community that's enough to have mm -hmm. reasonable benefit. Um, but the other thing to think about is that it's really easy to slide backwards out of a place of population immunity to more mm -hmm. um, easy or more rapid population transmission or community spread because there are constantly people being added to a population or removed from. Um, and by that I mean, right, in the, in the population of children, there are constantly new children entering a two to 12 age group, for example. Um, or in the, right, zero to two, new children being born and, and adding to that population. And so um, it, it's a moving target in that perspective or from that perspective that, um, this becomes an active process that doesn't actually go away until such time as we would potentially, at a global level, have talked about eradication. But that seems unlikely. Um, yeah. Probably close to impossible. Yeah, you know, I think that's a very insightful question. I don't think we know because I don't think we fully know and understand the uh, immunity and immune system dynamics when children encounter uh, SARS-CoV-2 and get COVID-19. So I think that's difficult. We do believe that they are able to spread. So I think it's a good question on that. And if we can vaccinate more children to help reduce the spread, because it does look as if getting vaccinated does reduce your ability to spread the disease from the early data that is returned. So that would be helpful and that will help all over for that population uh, immunity. But, uh, you know, insightful question. Again, I don't think we have the full answers right now. I think that's it for reporters right now. All right. Well, let's turn to Dr. Love. Welcome back, especially since this is a busy time of the year for you, mm -hmm. I'm sure. According to some studies, uh, maybe out of Germany recently, um, the pollen season has grown longer over the past couple of decades. Uh, does that matter clinically? Do you agree with it? And if so, what does it really mean for those who um, have allergies for for to pollen and, and suffer in pollen season? Yeah, absolutely. So the um, first question is, yes, I agree. The pollen season mm -hmm. has been getting longer and more intense over several years. Um, especially last year, we had a really bad pollen season here in Kansas. And it's not exactly clear why um, that's happening. There's a few contributing factors, but one hypothesis is that it's just a little bit more conducive for the plants to produce lots of pollen. And I apologize, the second question, if you remind me again. Uh, when, or because that's true, what impact is that having on 
our community of patients who suffer from allergies to pollen? Absolutely. So um, the uh, length of the season and the intensity of the pollen production will impact people clinically because they're ex being exposed to pollen more often and more frequently. And um, I think I used the term previously that the plants are producing super pollens so they can travel farther, they can cause more symptoms with just a little bit of pollen, um, even more so than previous years. And um, is the spring the worst time for patients who suffer or is it the sort of always issue the season we're in um, yeah. or is fall uh, a bigger issue? Yeah, so it, it, I think it really depends on what the person is allergic to. So in the springtime, we have tree allergens. Summertime, we have grass allergens or pollens. And then late summer, we have weeds. And then the fall, late fall, we have molds. However, that being said, um, in the last few years, they have done research looking at, well, how often do consumers buy a lot of allergy medicines over the counter? Hmm. And that historically has been the spring season. Interesting. Mm -hmm. So in, in simple terms, uh, what happens uh, sort of physiologically or in the body of someone who um, is allergic and has a response to pollen? Yeah, so first of all, the pollen is typically a harmless substance. If you're allergic to that pollen, your body and its immune system will see that harmless substance as an intruder. And then it will start causing an allergic reaction where it will release chemicals that will cause you to have itchy nose, sneezing, watery eyes, stuffy nose, the whole gamut of your typical hay fever symptoms. And can those... Uh, symptoms, that allergic reaction, can that be severe or even life-threatening? The majority of the time it's really just uncomfortable. However, uh, there are some folks who have asthma that get triggered by their allergies, and mm. allergic asthma is a major cause for asthma exacerbations, especially in their um, peak season, and can actually result in severe exacerbation leading to the emergency room. You know, we know as a result of the, the COVID pandemic and over the last year, people are spending more time indoors mm -hmm. and also wearing masks. Have those things had an impact on allergy sufferers? Yeah, I would say um, it, I think most people will notice it this spring when they're wearing their masks outside. The mask is very effective at filtering out, you know, viral particles, debris, pollutants, um, and as a result, it's also effective at reducing exposure to pollens and allergens in the air. So if you're wearing your mask outside on a high pollen count day, you may not notice as many symptoms. The uh, one caveat to that is a lot of people are spending in time, time indoors, and if they're allergic to something inside the house, for example, dust mites or a moldy basement, then they might have more <laughs> symptoms indoors. Uh, so the balance is really hard to describe for each individual mm -hmm. person. Yeah, yes. interesting. You know, one of the questions we always want to make sure uh, we ask and answer is uh, related to this topic, related to allergies, at what point should someone really seek medical attention or seek the consultation of an expert? Yeah, so that is a great question. I am um, a big proponent of seeing an allergy doctor, but I'm biased. Um, <laughs> however, uh, I would say, you know, if, if you're trying a lot of over-the-counter medications, if you're on multiple medications and you're not getting the relief that you are looking for, that might be a good time to really reach out to an allergist or request to see a board-certified allergist just because we can help identify what you're allergic to, we can help with medication management, um, and sometimes some, for some folks, they might even have to be on allergy shots. You know, um, I've seen even people who work here in the health system who finally, after years of suffering, go and see an allergist and actually get tested and are surprised at exactly what they're allergic to mm -hmm. and how significant the response is. Is mm -hmm. that common for you to see? Yes, um, you know, there's the, I think the thing that a lot of patients um, worry about is, you know, am I allergic to a pet in my home? Um, or they're in the denial that they're allergic to the pet in their home and they're <laughs> finally walking into our clinic and 
we can prove it on paper to them. And so then we can uh, in, in start doing the measures to make lifestyle changes to make their um, quality of life mm -hmm. better. Mm -hmm. And probably the most common question that, <laughs> that we've all gotten, at least up until vaccine season, yeah. is how do we tell the difference between mm -hmm. allergy symptoms and COVID-19 symptoms? Yeah, so I get this question a lot. <laughs> um, so there are a few symptoms that do overlap with COVID-19 and really all viral, upper respiratory viral infections. So congestion, a runny nose, and potentially loss of smell. So that, that can overlap. However, in um, allergic symptoms or hay fever, uh, you will typically get some type of itchy eyes, itchy nose, sneezing alongside your symptoms. And then with COVID infection, it is more common to have fevers, severe fatigue, um, really bad headaches, especially in the back of the head, um, not the front of the head. Um, and then as well as diarrhea that can also happen. Um, and uh, as I said, you know, just a lot of those symptoms are more common with COVID-19 infection. I've never seen someone with bad allergies get terrible diarrhea. That's good. Yes. <laughs> yes, very much. Uh, sounds Thomas. like something you would not want <laughs> to have at the same right. time. Yeah. That's right. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, Jill, let's get to some questions from the community this morning. And the community is just like the reporters. They've got a lot of questions today. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to start with Donna because it's kind of on topic. She wants to know, should I stop taking my daily over-the-counter allergy, allergy medicine before getting the vaccine? Uh, so the answer I would say is no. So um, we want you to be as healthy as possible before you go and get your vaccine. Um, but also I want to make sure that your allergy symptoms are really well controlled. So um, if you're already on an antihistamine pill for your allergy symptoms, I would just continue taking it. And I think maybe to sort of expand mm -hmm. antihistamines as the mm -hmm. primary uh, over-the-counter medication class for allergy symptoms don't really interfere with the immune response generated from a vaccine, correct? Uh, correct. That is absolutely correct. Um, so things like your uh, Zyrtec or mm -hmm. Cetirizine, Claritin, uh, Allegra, none of these will interfere with your immune response to the vaccine. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Great point. Are there any medications that interfere? You know, uh, and please correct me, I was, you know, under the understanding that, you know, really the, the symptoms from a cough and cold, a viral illness, are a different mechanism than the symptoms from allergies, even though some of those symptoms may be the same, such as runny nose or sinus congestion, things of that nature. So I wouldn't really imagine that any of those allergic type medicines are going to interfere in that way. Janet wants to know, um, this question is for Dr. Love. Mm -hmm. My son-in-law is hesitant in getting the COVID vaccine due to he heard that if you have an anaphylactic reaction to penicillin, which he did, mm. that you should not take the vaccine. Is that correct? Actually, I advise differently. And per CDC guidelines, um, the only absolute contraindication to getting the COVID vaccine is if you've had a severe allergic reaction to the COVID vaccine or a vaccine component. Um, so I would uh, advise this person if they have had anaphylaxis to penicillin um, that they should go ahead and get the COVID vaccine. Now they might need a 30 minute observation time, um, which is what I'd recommend for anyone who's had a history of anaphylaxis to something other than the COVID vaccine. And I would also recommend this person come and see mm -hmm. us. <laughs> yeah, I would second that. You know, we do understand, and I deal with this on a daily basis, mm -hmm. uh, on the hospital floors or in my clinic of, of people having certain reactions or allergies to certain antibiotics and that really prohibits our ability to use our best life-saving drugs for you should you come in. So it's important to really tease that out and get an understanding of is this a true reaction. Uh, I saw a person yesterday in clinic who his family has a history of penicillin allergy. Um, you know allergies really typically don't follow family lines like that. Um, so it's really important to understand if you think you do have allergies because antibiotics are life-saving drugs. You know, get to see an allergy, uh, an allergy specialist, come to see Dr. Love and kind of really get that question answered. And, and just to say, right, we've done well over 50,000 individual mm -hmm. COVID 
immunizations, right, administered more than 50,000 vaccines, and we have not seen anaphylaxis even in those who are part of our population that we treat or that are employed here who have a history of anaphylaxis to a number of different substances, penicillin included. And so we do offer a longer observation period. Mm -hmm. uh, and I know that other clinics across the metro area, uh, some of the county health departments, for example, not only add um, an additional 15 minutes to the waiting period to make it 30, but also separate those who've had anaphylaxis and administer their vaccine in an area where a paramedic or a physician is available immediately if there is an issue. And still, we've not really seen um, anything of significance, at least in those um, you know, community clinics that we're very close to. And so that doesn't mean it's impossible, but I think that the risk of really having some significant reaction, even if you had it before, is, is low and definitely lower, Dana, as you have said, than mm -hmm. the risk of um, long-term implications yeah. or severe yeah. uh, disease from a COVID infection. Yeah. I mean, I think it's a good question because a lot of people do have mm -hmm. these questions or have, um, you know, have had reactions to antibiotics or other drugs in the past. So it's a very good question to ask, but um, you know, I, I think Dr. Love's answer is right on point. All right, Ashley asks, will pediatricians be receiving Moderna vaccine since it's currently the only one approved for 16 and 17 year olds? And how do we ensure that our 16 year old gets Moderna? Is that right? Was it Moderna or Pfizer? It's the Pfizer, Pfizer. Yeah. 16 yeah. and up. Right. Um, and some pediatrics practices, pediatricians offices or subspecialists are receiving Pfizer. We know, for example, our partners at Children's Mercy mm -hmm. have been for uh, several weeks now, maybe months actually, working uh, within the EUA. So for those 16 years of age or older with significant medical concerns have been vaccinating that population and providing some doses to pediatrics offices, just general pediatricians who might be treating and seeing uh, those in the 16 and up age group who are in phase. So um, I don't know specifically if there is a plan to funnel, for example, mm -hmm. individual or specific numbers of doses to pediatric practices uh, on either side of the state line, uh, primarily because we're still at the point where there are far more people wanting the vaccine than there are doses. But I am sure yeah. at some point that will happen. And, and just for uh, maybe a point of clarity, if a 16 or 17 year old gets scheduled in our clinic simply by the registration process, we ensure that they are only getting a Pfizer dose. So we have Moderna doses this week for the first time in several weeks, but you cannot schedule someone who's 16. It's, uh, the, the, the scheduling system just doesn't allow it. So there are protections in place to make sure uh, that you're getting the appropriate dose for you if age is the determining factor. And I will comment that Children's Mercy did um, make an announcement. I, I don't know if it was in the last week or so, but starting April 1st, they are vaccinating 16 and older, um, including their, their high-risk population and anyone who is of a, um, a minority population. Yeah, I think one of the limiting steps there is obviously the cold chain storage, mm -hmm. especially for some of those uh, small standalone pediatrics offices. Mm -hmm. but be a problem for every clinic yeah, really for absolutely. a little while until we figure out the logistical details. Okay, so Sharon has got a little bit of a story and a great question. Mm -hmm. okay. So she and her husband were both part of the Moderna study. Um, she found out they did in fact get the vaccine. Friday, she was doing a follow-up routine test, mm -hmm. tested positive for COVID, yeah. PCR. Yeah. She said her husband was negative. She said, really not sick, a little bit of allergic type symptoms, allergy symptoms. Um, but she said, my question is, do I isolate from my husband? Do I need to wear my mask now in the house? Should we be sleeping in separate rooms? And also, do, oh shoot, I'll get the second question, my, my phone <laughs> ran. I answer those. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. Uh, First of all, I think um, we would advise that that positive PCR mm -hmm. is, should be treated as a positive. Mm -hmm. And all the questions about how do we act, how do we respond, are exactly the same as they were if you had not had a vaccine. Yeah. Uh, so yes, right, you would want to take the steps that you've outlined, Sharon, to make sure that 
um, you've isolated from your husband, mm -hmm. uh, that you uh, are able to manage your sort of movement throughout the house with masks on, um, all of the mitigation strategies to prevent transmission that, that would have, uh, we would have suggested in any other circumstance apply. Yeah. Interestingly, um, we know that with a 94 or 95% efficacy that there will be breakthrough infections and it's probably mm, very likely that they'll be more mildly symptomatic mm -hmm. as you describe yours, yeah. uh, your symptoms being allergy, sort of mild allergy symptoms. Um, and uh, the reason I bring that up is you know, that in itself is likely a benefit, especially uh, compared to severe disease that we've seen, right, requiring hospitalization or even ICU care. And so um, that shouldn't necessarily be viewed, and I know you're not suggesting it, but for the general sort of population who might be asking, that shouldn't be viewed as a failure of the vaccine either. Uh, the fact that, right, you're have very mild symptoms and we now um, know that you've tested positive and have a plan to manage that helps us prevent transmission and severe disease, which has always been the goal. Yeah, I think the critical answer here is two words, vaccines work. You know, luckily you are very mildly symptomatic. Your chance and your risk of going to the hospital having severe disease and death is extremely lowered by the vaccine, as is that for your husband. Um, the guidance has not changed. You know, we do have, uh, there was a small study published in Clinical Infectious Diseases last week uh, from the v of Pittsburgh VA uh, about a nursing home and nursing home patients, and they actually did show a reduction in the amount of virus that you replicate in those who are vaccinated versus those who are unvaccinated, and it did show a reduction. So that is a good thing, but right now the guidance hasn't changed. So I would still, from that 10 days of the test or when the symptoms started, continue to isolate for those 10 days and, and do those mitigation strategies. But overall, um, I'm glad you got your vaccines. And I do believe that that has and will continue to protect you and your husband, again, from that risk of severe disease and going to the hospital. Um, so. And, and Sharon, just for the record, says that she attributes her runny nose to spring allergies. Yeah. She wants Dr. Love to Blame do that. Why not Dr. Love? Um, she also asked, does, <laughs> do you think the study personnel will report the positive results to yeah. the state of Kansas? Are those reported? Yes. I would so say, yeah. any, any lab, regardless of study um, uh, being, you know, a, a clinical trial being the cause or reason for the test or symptoms being the reason for the test, any positive PCR will be reported to the state um, by any lab that ran it. So uh, that will happen regardless of the reason for the test. Okay. Um, I think we have time for a couple more questions, maybe. Uh, Kathy wants to know, will allergy patients be getting the vaccine for COVID through their allergy visits? Mm -hmm. uh, so I can't speak for other institutions and other offices, but here at the University of Kansas Health System, um, we are having all our patients get their COVID vaccine through the COVID vaccine clinic. Yeah, I mean, our goal is to have every primary yeah. care and specialty <laughs> clinic and private pharmacy able to have some yes. sort of vaccine to be able to give to people when they come through their visits. Yeah. And I, th I think that might, sorry to interrupt, I think that might help, especially if you are doing it in one of your specialty clinics, so that physician can answer your question or that medical team can answer these, you know, these insightful questions that you have. Yeah, and I apologize, I was just going to say clear, uh, and clarify, uh, that's what we're currently doing right now. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think in general, whether it's in our facility or really anywhere across uh, the state, or the country, the goal of every healthcare delivery system is to make it easy to get the vaccine, as easy as possible in as many places as possible. There are, uh, as we've talked about at length before, some logistical challenges of cold chain storage or multi-dose vials in the current sort of delivery setup and process for both Moderna and for, uh, for Pfizer. Some are, are much easier with the J&J the, the &J product, but there are some challenges to sort of making it um, available in clinics that would do one or two or three doses a day. Um, and so that, that becomes our challenge to work through over the next few months as we really move from this process of centrally located high volume clinics, a COVID vaccine clinic that only does that, to making it really, really easy to mm -hmm. get the vaccine anywhere you desire. Okay, I like. There's two final, mm. final questions, okay? Wow. The final, Karen, final. Okay. Final, final. So final, <laughs> final of one of the two questions is, Karen says that she's had reaction, bad reactions to a tetanus vaccine, mm. and, and she's had to divide it, like do a half a dose 
and it sounds like it's hives and swollen throat, emergency room visits, yada, yada. Um, mm. She doesn't have any problem taking the flu vaccine. She's just wanting to know. She says, I'm 61. I have COPD. Um, do you think it's safe for her to get the, the shot, the COVID shot? Well, I'll take a stab at this. Um, so first, um, if there is any hesitation and you're really concerned, please just come see us. I'm happy to walk you through potential risks versus benefits um, based on your personal conditions. I would argue that since you have been tolerating the flu vaccine over the last few years, it's reassuring and that most likely you would tolerate the COVID vaccine mm -hmm. as well. Um, but again, I, I think we would have to take a really detailed look into your history of vaccinations and um, see what else uh, you've reacted to in the past, if you've had any other drug reactions or uh, reactions to components of the current COVID vaccines. Um, but if, as I said, our door is open to you. Great answer. Yeah. Okay, final, Perfect final. Perfect from our specialist. Comes from, yes, comes from Peggy. And she has a college kid in uh, that's going to be coming home. She doesn't live around here. And she's supposed to get her shots before she comes back to Kansas. She said she's pre-registered for April 19, which she has no idea what that means. But the question is, um, if she ends up not able to get both shots, how much of a problem will that be? What do they need to do? Yeah, it's a great question, and there are a number of circumstances that sort of create um, this challenge for people, right? Um, I, whether it's I'm coming back from college, or mm -hmm. I spend the winter in Arizona, or you name it. Uh, and um, in the long run, I think it's um, the goal, not think, I know it's the goal, to say we would be able to help manage those situations. Mm -hmm. um, at the moment, uh, first and second doses are still paired. So we don't get any second doses uh, for anyone that we did not provide a first dose for. And so we don't really have the option to help in that situation. And so my best advice is to guarantee uh, that you can get or your daughter can get both doses by remaining wherever she is until after she's received the second, even if that's after, say, school was out or she was scheduled to come home. Um, of course, the flip side is it's very likely or uh, very possible that we'll have the ability to be able to, to get people in uh, without long lead times, long waits, so schedule appointments for the next day or two days after uh, for a first dose that here that would then allow you to get both doses here. So um, it, it's sort of a either or. I would not make plans to get one dose somewhere else and then expect to be able to get a second dose easily after returning home. So either plan for it before leaving or plan for it after returning home would be my best advice to make it easy. Yeah, I mean, hopefully in the future, too, uh, they'll be so readily available that um, if you're able to get one, say, at a, a one of the national pharmacies, like we've heard about Walgreens and CVS having those programs, they would have it in their computer as well, in their computer system. And so going to another one, say out of state or somewhere else, they'd be able to just to pull up that information. Um, right now, there just isn't that system. But hopefully, as number one, more vaccines and more supply comes in, and also possibly one or two other new vaccines come in, that will be less of an issue. All right. Well, thank you all so much, both uh, from the media and the community, for great questions this morning. Uh, it's always a good day when when we sit here and nod our head and say, wow, great question. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it's an even better day when we have great answers from our, from our guests and specialists. So thanks for that, Dr. Love. Tomorrow, uh, Marian Ramirez Mantilla, director of the Juntos Center for Advancing Latino Health at KU Medical Center, and Dr. Ed Ellerbeck, the chair of our population health department, join us to offer a big picture look at the RADx UP program and how they are working to empower local community teams to advance testing and vaccination. We hope to have someone from the front lines, too, who is doing that work in the community join us as well. So yeah. looking forward to that conversation. As we wrap up this morning, Dr. Love, any final thoughts? Uh, just a few things. Number one, I highly encourage you go get your COVID vaccine. Number two, still encourage you to practice good social distancing measures and wear your mask. And finally, number three, if your allergies are getting out of control, 
come knock on our door and see us. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think perfectly said, you know, we hope that we can vaccinate our way out of this pandemic. Uh, we're getting closer day by day, but, uh, you know, COVID-19 and the spread continues to be a, a behavioral disease. Um, we need everybody to continue to be vigilant. We are seeing a rise in cases nationwide, luckily around in our local community. It's, it's not to that extent yet, but continue to do the smart things, just as Dr. Lovett said. I'd echo all of those things. Uh, we're continuing to do a good job, I think, here in our community. And we're not seeing some of the same picture in Kansas that we are seeing in other mm -hmm. states, but that doesn't mean we can't or won't. So uh, stick with the program, uh, the pillars of infection prevention and control that we've talked so much about. Uh, you know, uh, the, the final thing I'll say today, and this is, this is partly for Stites and partly for our gang in the control <laughs> room, I've been trying to practice Star Trek references. Mm -hmm. And so the goal, right, is to live long and prosper. The guys can mark it on the board. There we go. This might, might be the first one this week. Uh, but, but we've sort of uh, hoped throughout this entire time that we can give you the tools to be able to do that, that we can share with you the appropriate information, really clarify any questions you have, make sure that right, what we're sharing is, is based in fact and evidence and the best knowledge we have at the moment so that you can make the best decisions to keep you and your family safe out there. Uh, we're, we're very thankful for the opportunity to do that and very thankful for, for you joining us uh, here now uh, most days for quite some time. And with that, uh, take care, be safe out there, and we'll see you tomorrow.